Today I'm going to speak about the title of Jesus, which emphasizes that he proceeds out of eternity and spans all time. The title is Alpha and Omega. It is found in Revelation chapter 1 verses 7 and 8. Here the revelator John speaks about the visible return of Jesus in glory. And he says this, Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. To understand the full meaning of that title, the Alpha and the Omega, we need to be familiar with a little about the Greek alphabet. The Greek alphabet begins with the letter Alpha and ends with the letter Omega. Alpha is the first letter, Omega is the last. As, for instance, in the English alphabet, A is the first letter, Z is the last. So, Jesus, we've already seen earlier in these studies, is the Word of God. When he says, I'm Alpha and Omega, he means he's the complete Word of God. Everything that God has to say is summed up in him. It also means that everything God does begins with Jesus, and everything God does ends with Jesus. He's the beginning and the ending. It's said here, the Lord God who is, and who was, and who is to come. That's the same picture. God is now, he was in the past, he will be all at once. He's Alpha and Omega. It has a particular application to the close of the present age because the age is going to close in Jesus. He's going to be the one who will bring this age to its close. As he was Alpha at the beginning, so he will be Omega at the end. This is brought out in Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 where the writer says, In the past God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son. The final message of God, the complete and total message, is in his Son, Jesus. And of the Son, the writer says this, Whom God appointed heir of all things, through whom he made the universe. So you see, Jesus was the beginning of creation. Through him God made the universe. He was Alpha. He's also the appointed heir of all things. Everything is going to be summed up and come to its culmination in Jesus. As the Creator, He's Alpha. As the heir of all things, He's Omega. He spans all time. He proceeds out of eternity, on through time, and into eternity. He is the Eternal, the Uncreated, the Only Begotten of the Father, the beginning and the end. God transcends time, you see but he also operates in time. There's a double relationship. God works in time, but he himself is outside of time and before time. It's hard for the human mind to comprehend that, but there are beautiful pictures in the scripture which present it to us. For instance, the words of Psalm 90 verse 2 address to God. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You are, it's, there's always a present tense with God in a sense, but he's from everlasting to everlasting. He's from eternity to eternity. He comprehends all time. He's the beginning. He's the ending. He's Alpha. He's Omega. Prophetically, this truth was specifically applied to the coming Messiah, to the coming King, fulfilled in Jesus. For instance, in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, the prophet said, Of the Messiah who was to come. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. What a clear prediction that is of the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. He, it was predicted that he was to come out of Bethlehem, the city of David. And he was to be the one who was to rule for God, his people Israel. But then it says at the end, his origins are from of old, from ancient times. Although he was born as the babe in the stable in Bethlehem, his origin is from eternity. He's Alpha and Omega. He came into time, but he was not of time. 
He was from eternity. He is to eternity. Jesus says the same about himself. He was speaking to the Jewish people about their relationship and his relationship to Abraham. They were claiming that they were descendants of Abraham and in essence they said that's all that really matters. But Jesus said something to them that absolutely startled and shook them. He said, your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You are not yet 50 years old, the Jews said to him, and have you seen Abraham? I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. That's his eternity. That's his timelessness. He was born into time, into human history, but he is from before time. He is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, the first and the last. The title Alpha and Omega also depicts the place of Jesus in our individual lives. It's not merely in relationship to creation and the universe that he's Alpha and Omega, but that's the position that he occupies in the life of each one of us who believes in him. Listen to what the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. That's what Jesus is, the author, the beginner, the alpha, the perfecter, the completer, the omega. And as long as we keep our eyes on Jesus, we find in him and through him everything we need. There's nothing outside of Jesus that we need. He spans our whole need from Alpha to Omega. The important thing is that we don't take our eyes off Jesus, that we don't start looking in some other direction and think that somehow Jesus is not able to provide all that we need. He can. He is. It's in Christ that it will all end and find fulfillment and completion after time has ended. Christ is the Alpha and the Omega. Right at the end of the book of Revelation, Jesus speaks to John, the Revelator, and he says this in Revelation 22, 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. Actually, there are two titles in that verse, the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. However, the title that we want to focus on is the second one in that verse, the bright morning star. The bright morning star is the sun. And I'm going to have to spell that word from time to time because of the similarity of sound of those two English words. The sun, S-U-N. The reason why Jesus is called the sun is because of certain specific unique features of the sun in our world. I'll pick out two. First of all, the sun in our universe is the sole universal source of light and heat and therefore of life itself. Without the sun there can be no life in our world. He supplies everywhere both light and heat. Secondly, the sun, because of the fact that it sets and rises, appears and disappears, always carries with it the promise of sunrise after darkness. So those are the two associations. Secondly, the sun always carries with it the promise of sunrise after darkness. For uh, some further scriptures on that first application, the sun as the sole universal source of light and heat we look for a moment in Psalm 19, verses 4 through 6, which is a very vivid and beautiful picture of the heavenly bodies and in particular of the sun. The psalmist says, In the heavens God has pitched a tent for the sun. Isn't that beautiful? The heavens are like the tent for the sun. Then it goes on to say, The sun, who is like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion, like a champion rejoicing to run his course, it speaks of both of the beauty and the strength of the sun. He's like a bridegroom adorned in his glorious attire, and he's like a champion who runs a race in full strength. Then it goes on, verse 6, It rises at one end of the heavens, 
and makes its circuit to the other, nothing is hidden from its heat. That's a profound scientific truth which we recognize today. Everything in our world derives light and heat from one unique source, the sun. And that's how Jesus is to this world. He's the sole source of light and heat and therefore of life itself. He's like the bridegroom. He's like the strong man. He's beautiful and he's glorious. Let's look also in Hebrews 1 verses 1 through 3. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory. We'll go no further than that. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Of course, the word sun in that last phrase is S-O-N, but the phrase, the radiance of God's glory, immediately reminds us of the sun, S-U-N. So, Jesus is the radiance of the glory of the sun, which is God the Father. There's a very beautiful parable there in nature, in the reality of the sun and its light. Let me just take a moment to unfold it to you. It's so beautiful. There's a picture of the total nature of God, Father, Son, S-O-N, and Holy Spirit. It's represented to us by the sun and by its light and by our experience. The substance of the sun represents God the Father. Nobody has ever seen the substance of the sun. Nobody has ever seen God the Father. The manifest brightness, the radiance of the sun, represents God the Son. And the rays that convey that brightness to us, that make it possible for us to actually see that brightness, represent God the Spirit. And interestingly enough, these rays are refracted in the rainbow into seven colors, the distinctive number of the Holy Spirit. So there's just a little parable in nature. The substance of the sun is God the Father. The radiance or the glory of the sun is Jesus Christ, the Son. The rays that convey that radiance to you and me, that's the Holy Spirit. The second thing I said about the Son, as it represents Jesus, is that it always carries with it the promise of sunrise after darkness. This is clearly predicted in Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Surely the day is coming, it will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And that day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in his wings, and you will go out and leap like calves released from the storm. So the scripture warns us there's coming a time of God's wrath and indignation on the wicked and the rebellious. But at the same time, in the midst of the warning, God gives us a promise of deliverance and help that comes in the person of the Son of Righteousness. That's the Lord Jesus. Out of all the midst of the anguish and the tribulation and the darkness, there's going to arise that bright morning star, the Son of Righteousness, with healing in its wings. It's going to bring deliverance and healing, rest and peace, to those, it says, who revere or fear God's name. There's got to be an inner preparation before that Son of Righteousness will arise for us with healing and with deliverance. Peter says in his second epistle, chapter 1, verses 16 and 19, he's speaking about the promise of the coming of the Lord Jesus in glory. And he says it requires preparation on our part. He says, we did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Peter is looking back in his memory to that scene on the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus was transfigured before their eyes and they saw him in his glory and in his majesty and in his brightness. So he says, remember, it's not just a theory, it's something we've witnessed. But then he goes on to say, we have the word of the prophets made more certain, 
and you will do well to pay attention to it, as to a light shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. You see, the morning star, that's Jesus, rising in our hearts is not his coming in power and glory to judge the universe, but that's an inner personal experience. When we have come to know him personally, and through the revelation of God's Word and the prophecies of Scripture, we've come to a quiet, unshakable inner confidence that Jesus is coming back to reign. The Son of Righteousness is going to rise for those who fear God's name. I wonder today if you have that inner assurance, if the return of Jesus in glory is a reality for you. Has that morning star risen in your heart? The scripture says that we do well to pay attention to the prophecies of, of the Bible. If we will fasten our minds on the Word of God and meditate on it and let the Holy Spirit speak to us through it, He will make the return of Jesus something very real, something about which we're absolutely confident. It will be like a star rising in our hearts and then it will be there till the day dawns, till the actual great event takes place till the Son of Righteousness arises out of the darkness of anguish and tribulation to give fresh light and hope to the people of this earth. So cultivate that awareness that Jesus is coming. Let it be a star that rises in your heart. I would just like to thank every one of you who supports this channel, and especially those of you who sponsors our work. Without you, this would not have been possible to share the gospel with millions of people every month. So thank you, and God bless you.